This is Rishwajit Singh on Left Click TV. Belarus has seen a series of protests against the results of the presidential elections in which President Alexander Lukashenko, who's been ruling for 26 years, won again. The results of this election and every election ever since he came into power have been disputed. To talk about the ground reality of this situation and give us some more context, I have on the line Quinsberry. He's a leftist living in Minsk, Belarus. He's also a YouTuber who mixes literary criticism and Warhammer. Quinsberry, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're giving the platform to speak about this because it's a very interesting story that is still unraveling with every minute. So we'll come back to this again, but can you give a very brief description on what's going on right now and why should the world pay attention now more than ever? Um, for the first time since the 90s, uh, an Eastern European country is going through a regime change. And, uh, well, a major regime change that opens up the country to the rest of the world, meaning both the East and the West for us, meaning Russia and the EU and the rest of the world. And um, this is a major change for many, many reasons, be it the human rights and democracy spreading to uh, Belarus finally. Uh, it is the involvement of the uh, Western countries and in, uh, in um, our, you know, non-privatized uh, everything yet. Most of our, a lot of our sectors are not privatized and there are a lot of Western companies that are very much interested in that. And uh, it is a move, uh, it's also a danger for the Russia, uh, again, having an ability to um, spread its influence even deeper in Eastern Europe and uh, as you may know, there was a big, big, uh, basically revolution in Ukraine, where Russia was directly involved in exiting parts of Ukraine and um, funding a civil war there. Um, a lot of people have similar concerns about Belarus. And um, it is a very major, major event that I think the world needs their eyes on, because a lot of people don't want any eyes on Belarus. So, because, and I think that it is very important that uh, with people have their eyes on Belarus for a long time now, because there's a lot of things that are going to happen here that are mostly outside of our control, really, hmm. to some extent. Yeah. So, before we get to the protests that have been happening recently and mm -hmm. are happening as we speak, can you give us a brief yeah. um, rundown on Belarusian history and what is it that has led us to this moment? So I will try to be short, and I will just tell you that after the Soviet Union fell apart, there was a major anti-communist pro-democracy movement that spread out uh, out of, so, out of uh, Belarusian intelligentsia. That was basically the liberal establishment trying to establish itself, very similar to how it was in many uh, Warsaw Pact countries. For big, one of the biggest examples of that happening, and successfully, I would say, would be Czech Republic, uh, Poland, countries like that, where you had those people um, protesting against Soviet Union and successfully establishing uh, uh, democratic republics with, with the return of the private property, et cetera, et cetera. Belarus went through a similar thing where we had uh, many, many people protesting and uh, getting independence for Belarus for the first time since forever, never. We never were in an independent state fully and in 1991 we got our independence and um, it was a huge mess mostly because of how all the economic ties were severed there was crime that was prominent etc etc um, and so what happened was there was it was basically huge um, it was crime was very high it was people were extremely poor public sector people had to find second jobs including like opening kiosks like medics doctors had to become like uh, sole proprietors of uh, kiosks to get their family through, you know? It was insane. Um, and uh, the same thing was happening everywhere. In Russia, the same. In the Russia, like they call this shock therapy. It's mm -hmm. the, when you privatize everything and then you wait until the, like the market bounces itself out. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a lot of people die. A lot of people like the public uh, things like uh, medical, and um, like education get destroyed financially because there is no money, uh, no taxes at all. And so uh, basically Belarus was really afraid of going that way. 
and they wanted law and order. And Lukashenko was the law and order candidate. He was the candidate who wanted to prevent that. He wanted to safeguard the positions of people in the public sector. He wanted to save the jobs uh, in the government-owned factories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and um, one could say he did it, you know, because we did have a very turbulent time, but he managed to prevent it to some extent and balance us out before we were, you know, just shoved into neoliberal capitalism, uh, you know, head first. Um, we did transition to a market system. That's very important because many people are very misinformed about Belarus and refer to it as a uh, market socialist system. Uh, while we, our private sector is giant, uh, we have our our businesses that are owned by the government are operated on market uh, by the market. You know, like they, we sell things on the market to the international market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we do privatize uh, very often, um, and very often to friends of Lukashenko, um, <laughs> who get you know the first grabs in terms of privatization. Uh, very similar to how they did it in Russia, but a bit more centralized. Uh, obviously, it's not all like that. But um, what we had is that we had a very authoritarian person who went and um, tried to use aesthetics of Soviet Union and tried to use this valor of stability of Soviet Union to uh gain support and he did it successfully uh he won the first election he got to power and instantly there were a lot of people who were very angry with him uh he disappeared about five four or five people in the 90s uh, journalists generals and prominent members that could uh prominent figures who could be you know uh, strong enough politically to get him off his presidential chair and he transitioned from a pro parliamentary to presidential republic by most likely falsifying his first election but it's very we have no idea what was it real or not really and uh, what we have is that we have this person in the position of power falsifying every single election removing the terms limit suppressing the opposition instituting a very s s severe police state we have i believe like one of the highest numbers of police per capita out of, you know in the world and um, uh, there are no political parties that are allowed in the parliament, ultimately. Um, I believe 97% of the parliament members are unaligned. They are not members of any political organizations, uh, and which means that they just do what they're told. And uh, I believe the rest are the Communist Party of Belarus people, who are a pro-president party of pensioners who just support the president. And um, they are basically leftover of the Soviet Union Communist Party that is basically, you know, dying of old age, literally. Uh, um, most of the political organizations that we had were not part of the system. And they were not, they, were, they did run in elections and they failed tremendously. And they created youth organizations and just political parties, et cetera, et cetera, of all sorts of different ideologies. Um, you know, we have um like a communist party splitters uh, the just world they're called we have the social democratic party we have christian democrats and uh, most of them exist in an alliance against lukashenko and a lot of them are getting funds from the west uh and uh, i believe it's you know it's obvious that they do because that's how you know most of the politics have been done here opposition throughout all these years under lukashenko ran their candidates um some of them got got, got in jail and then they get out and they, you know, the rents and repeats every five years. And then they basically do nothing but attempt to agitate for the protest. Uh, and this has been the history of Belarus, political history of Belarus uh, and political reality of Belarus until this year, ultimately. And a lot, a lot has changed this year. So can you talk a bit more about the modern political landscape as it exists right now? Like um, you talked about that, but are there any major political opposition leaders or anyone who's seriously challenging the current regime. Um, I saw like the major figure in these protests at least being Tikhanovskaya and um, yeah. I get, Svetlana uh, Tikhanovskaya, you, yeah. Could you, could you talk more about her and what's her history been in uh, Belarus and does she have the support of the people? Um, so what happened was um, three candidates, three presidential candidates were very heavily suppressed. Uh, two of them are in jail, including the husband of uh, Tikhanovskaya. He was originally running for president and he was uh, jailed uh, unjustly, and he's currently still in jail. Uh, 
three campaigns, presidential campaigns, united under the only candidate that got through of the of this group of people, uh, and it was Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. She was basically allowed in the election as a joke because people didn't think that she would get any support. And I believe that the opposition that I mentioned also didn't really believe that she would get any support. She's not part of any political organization other than her own um, her own uh, committee uh, that she that she started with the, the other two campaigns uh, of suppressed polit- uh, political campaigns, and they united on the single banner to run in the election. And um, I must say, her program was very good. Her program was literally. If you elect me as president in this election, I'll have another election. <laughs> That's it. She wanted to release the prisoners, the political prisoners. She wanted to do some adjustments to the how to the election um, uh, election legislation, mm-hmm. and uh, mostly to make it more transparent and more democratic, and uh, then do another election in about six months. And people really liked an idea of having an election without Lukashenko. And a lot of people came out in support of hers. And um, I must say that it has been a giant success. Uh, all, like everyone voted for her. It's insane. And then the official polls come out with, was it 7% for her? I believe it was around 7%. Um, with like 80% voting for Lukashenko. And uh, the streets of Belarus, not just Minsk, but the whole Belarus do not reflect those numbers at all. And um, this is the current political cycle, you know, political uh, sort of situation we have. Uh, The opposition official, the alliance of those opposition parties had a very different plan for this election. They wanted, uh, as interview with Vladimir Nikolaev, he is a Belarusian poet and he was a candidate uh, to the presidency uh, last time in 2015 and he basically spilled the beans on everything uh, in his interview to the freedom um uh radio freedom uh, in a live stream um two days ago um uh, or was it yesterday wait what day is it today it's monday There's yeah it's yesterday <laughs> there was so much happening i'm sorry it was so much happening i can't keep up so yeah and his whole take was very interesting what he said is that the plan of the opposition was to get a single candidate, uh, the united opposition candidate of all political parties, mm-hmm. and throw him in the election, and then not to run in the election, claiming they're fraudulent, going for a full boycott of elections, and then getting people out in the streets. That was the plan of the opposition. And because we know that, you know, if there are a lot of like they are the people to fund if it comes to the West, if we are talking about regime change Mm -hmm. and um, uh, they seem to be very, they had a very different plan and Tikhanovska wasn't a part of it. And I must say that the whole mood of those protests was it's very positive. It's people are coming out peacefully with flags, you know, singing songs, etc. And demanding a dialogue with the government. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nikolaev at that protest seemed like he wanted to be in control, but he couldn't. He even complained that there were no microphones so he could <laughs> address the people, you know? And yeah. it's like, no, dude, you're not the one, you know, doing the politics now. It's the people who are doing the politics. And right. that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm very, as a leftist myself, I am very um, positive about the current situation is because um, I'm very much afraid of the West and the East, you know, as mm. any reasonable person should be. And You'd there is a very though. nice saying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And there is a very nice saying that I've heard from, I believe it was Hassan Piker, a political commentator on Twitch. And he yep. said that your own dictator is better than a CIA plant. And I completely agree with that. Like, if you look at Turkey, for example, right? He was talking about Turkey specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, people did not support the opposition leader because he was a, basically a CIA. And they went out and supported Erdogan, despite the fact that he's extremely unpopular. Yeah. And I think it's a reasonable strategy for uh, people who are interested in politics to take. You know, you don't support the CIA because they are worse than the than the you know than your own dictator. I must say that currently. It seems to be that Lukashenko is trying not to be our own dictator. He's very much trying to be a pro-Russian dictator. He has threatened uh, violence, military invasion by Russia three times by now, um, with no legal backing of that event happening at all. Uh, He has 
threatened a lot of things. You know, he originally uh, was saying that the opposition is being paid by Russians. And now he is saying that the Russians are there to save him and the regime if something goes wrong. And it is the West who is doing the fraudulence, you know, and uh, I don't see any fraudulence for, for the most part. Like there is some involvement of the West. There is always involvement of the West. And I think what the left needs to realize is that Belarus is currently going through a very important step politically, where we are basically going from adolescence to adulthood in terms of the statehood. Right. We are throwing off the chains of the dictatorship, which was our childhood as a country. And now we are going to play the big game of geopolitics and act actually play it. Actually, we will have to respond to the provocations from the East and the West. We'll have to operate within the actual politics of international politics. And this is something that we didn't do for 25 years. It is something that our people have no knowledge of how to do ultimately. And um, we are doing it in, in the shadow of, of the empire that wants to consume us, like literally uh, Russia, with whom we have agreements about integration into Russia. We have signed those in the 90s and those are still in effect. And Russians are saying, hey, you promised to join with us peacefully in a single state. When, when are you going to continue with that? You know. And a lot of people are afraid that um, Lukashenko is going to go forth with a lot of those things when it comes to, and he's looking at what he can do uh, in terms of protecting his position as a leader of Belarus now. Because we have labor strikes, we have protests of doctors, media personalities, and media companies. Uh, private sector is supporting the protests. We have international support, grassroots support. We have everything. It is all going down. And uh, Lukashenko has nowhere to run ultimately. And the more days go by, the more, the the more a regime change in Belarus seems like a reality we'll have to deal with, rather than something we should or shouldn't support. You know. Right. So can you can you talk about the media there? Um, I understand that media freedom is not very good in Belarus, but how has the media reacted to this? How have people been communicating about this? How how is information dispersed there? So I must say that a lot of non-state media is actually very good here. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to speak objectively, despite the, the fact that we have like um, very unofficial censorship. You know, we don't have, I believe, any censorship laws on the books. But, you know, if you do something here and there, you get, you know, the state comes for you. Yeah. Uh, we had some journalists who disappeared. We have, during the protest, journalists were specifically targeted by the police. Uh, cameras were broken, SD cards confiscated and broken on the spot. Uh, international journalists, local journalists, they were are arrested and some of them were beaten. Uh, uh, and I'm not talking about like, oh, they just apprehended, you know, Western or Eastern or independent, everyone. Everyone but the state ones. State ones were prohibited and are still to a certain extent prohibited from covering what is happening in Minsk and in Belarus, like all over the country. Um, we have some uh, organ media organizations that people in the West have been criticizing for being CIA, basically. And I'm specifically talking about the uh, free Radio Freedom and uh, Charter 97. These two media organizations have been very heavily involved in the Belarusian politics and media space for years now, uh, since the 90s. And I must say that, unfortunately, they are very bad, they are bad um, target to point at in terms of who is doing the agitation, because um, what they have been doing is that, like, for example, Charter has been very heavily criticized by the Belarusian public for being too radical and violent. They were, uh, like, openly calling for, like, you know, overthrowing of the government and mm. being very, very heavily, you know, very violent in the rhetoric and our people didn't really like that you know um and they are not really a popular news source for belarusians currently um most of the people get the news from official newspapers and uh like to buy and uh, onliner who are not funded by the west and they are media companies local media companies that do coverage of the news as part of their job and they're pretty good and they are pretty objective and they are freely operating and posting about everything, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is a new media conglomerate basically taking birth right now 
and it's his Instagram, Instagram, Telegram channels. <laughs> Telegram is like WhatsApp here. Everyone mm -hmm. has Telegram. Telegram is a place where you have, you know, American Nazis who are banned from everywhere else and every, every, every Slavic person ever. Like every <laughs> Belarusian, every Ukrainian, every Russian has a Telegram and we operate on it. You know, mm -hmm. we send each other messages. It's encrypted. It's impossible to track. It's very good. And Telegram is also a place where you have many blogs. So people literally like blogging and posting pictures, video, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a lot of people are getting their news from there now because the official news doesn't really talk about anything like police brutality, acts of awful, awful things committed by the police. Um, like we're talking about uh, breaking bones, fingers. Uh, we had some instances of rape happening in the for the people who were unjustly detained uh and uh, it has been insane and a lot of people knew about that only because people in telegram posted about that and shared photos of people beaten up in hospitals because official news sources like uh, the state media doesn't cover it um and telegram is faster than any other news organization they are very quick to post and Nexta is one of the biggest news uh, organizations that are like they grew to almost two million subscribers on Telegram from, I believe, about 40, 400,000. So they quadrupled in size in this in this time. And it is literally like a single 20 year old sitting in Warsaw posting about Belarusian politics. And uh, he might as well have funding. I'm not saying he's not, you know, he's not funded by the West. But all mm. he's doing, basically, is he posting pictures sent to him by Belarusians. Uh, and during the protest, he did, like, police call-outs. Like, he was posting about location of the police and where they were. And um, uh, when it comes to direct agitation or organized um, overthrow of the government, he wasn't really effective in this regard. You know, it was, it was, it was very sloppy. There were a lot of fake news, like reports of helicopters and army people were giving, like, uh, given orders to shoot with live ammunition. There was a lot of fake news that went through Nexta and other Telegram channels. Uh, but despite that fact, they gave a platform for people to organize uh, themselves in chats, in private chats and private rooms. Um, no, I'm not aware of any organization, full on organization, doing the organizing for those protests. Mm -hmm. uh, and Telegram was basically doing the organizing. Uh, like, I would give you an example. I went to protests uh, years ago, you know, when I was like a teenager. I went to the protests, opposition protests, and it was run by the, you know, United Forces of the Opposition, of all those political parties. And those guys had literal lists. Like it was, for example, Mladi Front, the Youth Front, it's the young, youth or opposition organization, uh, and they are basically like, you know, anti-Lukashenko people of all different ideologies together, you know, and it's like a youth organization. And they had a person with a clipboard with a list of surnames of their members, and they were checking who came, you know, not to, not because they were paying them or anything, but because it's like, you know, it's an organization that mm. tracks its members. Uh, and... Um, there is nothing like that happening now. Like, I believe the, the, this protest is the biggest failure of the opposition ever. Because Lukashenko, with his police brutality and violence, managed to unite people outside of any organization currently and uh, spur a genuine revolution, basically, in Belarus. A revolution against himself. And only now, those opposition parties that are very, might as well be funded by the West. I'm not denying, you know, this. I don't have any receipts, but yeah, I'm very likely that they are. Only now they're trying to do anything about this, but they are not in control at all. And I hope that this uh, movement won't be hijacked by anyone in particular so that Belarus will finally have an open platform for political and social discussions so that we could raise actual questions regarding what is happening with our country with our people um because now if i start talking about taxes with people you know in taxation for example reform no one will listen because what would i do with this with my brilliant ideas like if i if, my, if your ideas in belarus get very brilliant you go to jail <laughs> you know because too many people support you so and this is not a climate for any sorts of politics to start you know and uh, hopefully this is very soon will change.
Right. So you said that the economy is under Lukashenko has been pretty well. Um, this limited privatization. I mean, you at least have key industries uh, under public control. Is that right? Yeah, uh, key industries are under public control. Most uh, importantly, we haven't privatized the uh, utilities. Right. We haven't privatized electricity, water, works. We haven't privatized education or medical system. We have a national healthcare service. And I must say, most people support this and want this to, to stay, you know. And Lukashenko, he might as well protected a lot of gains, social gains that Soviet Union like left us with. But our economy has been deteriorating year after year. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any swing to the right with privatization or to the left with any, you know, uh, progressive reforms. We have a um, static tax. You know, everyone pays seven percent. We don't oh, have a, you know, not a progressive tax. anything. We don't have a progressive tax, which would assist very much in funding of our social programs. Mm -hmm. Our schools are getting worse and more and more rely on donations by parents whose kids go to that to those schools, which are voluntary, you know, same with the medical system, which is overcrowded and uh, which is overrun and underfunded. And uh, despite that, our military is getting bigger and bigger. Our we're getting more and more rockets and beautiful, beautiful trucks to run on our parades every year. <laughs> That's what the, the, and beautiful. Uh, we're building beautiful um, uh, palaces, uh, presidential palaces and residencies for the president. And so that has been happening very well. Uh, but the people still basically get the same or even less money than they got 20 years ago with the mm -hmm. prices rising all the time. Uh, inflation is completely uncontrollable and uh, we are in desperate need of investment of any sorts, be it state investment, you know, in, in actual industries or foreign investment that is controlled by the state, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like we need a lot to we, we need to save the economy because it's falling apart more and more. And Russia is buying us out more and more. Uh, we had many key uh, industries, including gas transit company that operates uh, gas transit from Russia to Europe. Half of the stock was bought out by the Russian state corporations. And uh, this is happening more and more and more and more. Uh, in many cases, privatization, for example, of some uh, factories, like, for example, our clock factory in, in Minsk has led to a bit of them paying off the debts that the government, you know, had to the creditors and actually increasing the industrial capacity and getting, you know, opening new markets and getting new stuff out there and get out of the stagnation. Uh, and uh, a lot more people are in support of privatizing uh, industries that are not that are operating to you know that are not balanced that are failing right now mm -hmm. and um, i must say that the current uh, mood in belarus is that we really want to keep our education and our um our, our health care a lot of people are in support of raising the funding of them not privatizing them and um, it's very hard to tell what exactly is going to happen and what people actually support because you can't have those conversation current conversations currently this is and um, like removing lukashenko will open up the floodgate of politics entering belarus real politics actual politics uh, issue based politics not uh, alignment based politics like we had before um, and uh, I talk to the young people, I talk to people I know, and I see that there is a lot of progressive potential in Belarus, a lot of potential of, for the left wing to actually start here. Most of the unions, for example, here are basically a government agency designed to placate workers from organizing. And a lot of people now are leaving those unions and organizing independent, uh, like not full on unions currently. But uh, as of now, they are organizing outside of unions uh, to do strikes. They're doing like uh, strike committees. So are, where are they elect, independent yeah. unions allowed or are they criminalized? By independent unions are allowed because unionization is a right guaranteed by the mm -hmm. constitution of Belarus, current constitution. But we have like three of them, three independent unions or something like that for the whole country. Okay. And uh, they are very much heavily suppressed, <laughs> except for one in the city of Soligorsk. 
uh, where we have salt mines and the union there, they organized in the 90s and they managed to get extreme gains for the miners of Belarus, uh, of Soligorsk, uh, where they raised the pay, like they doubled the pay, they doubled the compensation for the widows of miners who die during on work. And they have managed to create this pro-union climate in that one city. Uh, so much so that, like, I know some friends of mine who are from that city who were, like, very reactionary on everything except for unions. <laughs> because they grew up with this union. And they're like, yes, unions are great. Unions are amazing, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like people, but they were, like, very bad on all, all other, other things. So, yeah. like, I must say <laughs> that... Um, Unionization is something that can happen if we remove states suppressing that, which has been a thing for the longest time. People need to realize that Lukashenko hasn't been like a left-wing dictator who wanted to preserve Soviet Union. He was an oligarch with a very centralized bureaucratic state backing him, which fell apart really quickly when people got access to the internet and the phones, basically, you know? And when your babushka uh, managed not to look at news on the, on the TV where they lie to you, but on the phone where she can read and see for herself what is actually happening in the country. Because, the, for example, the fraudulent elections, we have dozens of videos and audios of people in the election committees just recording fraud happening. Like people take uh, ballots from the pile of Tikhanovskaya and just putting it on the pile of Lukashenko and then claiming Lukashenko won. Ooh. And then denying uh, the, the commission who don't want to do the fraud, denying them the recount. The right to recount. So how, and, um, are there just videos of them is, doing this? Yeah, yeah, there are videos oh. and audios of them doing it. Yeah, there are there are videos of state official bureaucrats coming to the election committees and threatening them with their jobs if they don't commit fraud. And this is not just some fake news because we know the schools, we know the names of the people, we know people who are threatening. Um, this is a criminal offense that is being committed. Uh, you can go to jail up to for five years in Belarus for f- election fraud. And election fraud is everywhere, like everywhere where independent observers were allowed to participate in the counting of the votes. Tikhanovskaya won with like crazy numbers, Mm -hmm. but everywhere where they were either jailed, which happened very often, they were arrested by the cops uh, or they were just simply not allowed on the counting of the ballots. Wow, Lukashenko, 80 percent. Amazing results. (laughs) Congratulations with the sixth term. You know, like it's insane. And I don't think it's a healthy climate currently. And um, with police brutality, with obvious election fraud, we are at the point when every single, like people from every single way of life, of social class, they are walking outside in the streets and they are talking about this. And I believe Lukashenko is on the verge of the fall currently. There is no one he can rely upon except for the police and the army. There is no silent minority that was very much prevalent in the past, which was like this myth of the Lukashenko voter. Like it was basically created by the media of the idea that everyone just silently supports Lukashenko. It's the older generation and it is 20 year olds like me who like, you know, run around uh, and want some freedom or whatever, as they said, you know, and uh, currently there is no it's not just 20 year olds it's everyone it's the medics who have to treat people with awful wounds committed to them you know in the prisons uh, by the riot police it is uh, the ex-army members who are throwing out their you know the spesna's jackets and saying that i you have put a shame on our uh, uniform and on our pledge of allegiance to the people of belarus and i don't want to have this uniform in my house anymore and you have workers going on strikes for the first time since the 1989, I guess, when Soviet Union was falling apart, when you when the when the workers went on strikes. And uh, yes, the West is surrounding us, and there have been news of European Union wanting to support the strikes and the strikers financially, which gives me very heavy Allende Chile vibes when they uh, supported the striking uh, truckers. Uh, USA, the CIA supported the striking uh, truckers. Uh, but the big difference there is that uh, to, basically to, to do the regime change and institute the regime of uh, Pinochet. Uh, the big difference in that case was that 
the those strikes were very heavily organized by organizations on the ground which were funded by the CIA which is not the case here it's very much chaotic and uh, it's the biggest another big difference is that it was instigated by the west in our case it wasn't it was a grassroots idea of if we take away the factories from the president he will have to listen which has been a fact and he has been listening and he even flew on a helicopter to a couple of like um, factories today where he was met with workers just booing him. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, he even said uh, today that uh, he was he's responding to the workers saying that you say there is election fraud and you want a fair election, people start to cheer yes. And then he responds with, there will be another president in Belarus over my dead body, is what he said today. Uh, while like there is no point in lying at this point, I guess this is true because he used to say that, oh, no, no, no. Once the people of Belarus do not require my services, <laughs> I'll take my uh, my briefcase and I'll leave. Uh, that's like a direct quote. But now he has a very different attitude and a very different mood because he realizes there is no one he can, no support is there. No one supports him. That's it. He's done. The question is when and how. And I really hope that these protests have been non-violent so far and very interesting like people self-organized they were taking off the shoes when they were standing on public benches not to make the public benches in the parks dirty they were collecting trash themselves and uh, for example if you you might have seen the biggest protest in belarus 20 hundred thousand people in the streets in Minsk. Did, yeah. you might have seen the footage mm -hmm. um my friend was in a car and filming an instagram story uh, after that whole thing happened, there wasn't a single trash piece in that spot at all. People have picked up after themselves, you know, just to make sure that no trash is left. You know, people don't want to, you know, th th this is the general mood we have now of peaceful protest of, um, you know, expressing ourselves, uh, expressing our concerns and, and demands. People are not just concerned. People are very angry. People want change desperately, and but they don't want any provocateurs. People are paranoid about Russian and state provocateurs. Uh, they like there was a protest next to the government building, um, the, the the main you know the uh, the parliament I believe right, and uh, they made the point to step backwards from the building by saying let's put like women at the front and let them sit so that we won't have anyone throwing rocks at the police who was present there or the windows. So because they are afraid that the, there are people in the crowd that wants to instigate violence, and those are provocateurs, state provocateurs most likely, and there most likely are people like that, because there have been some instances of violence that sprout out of nowhere, and people are very paranoid about not getting to this. You know, people, Belarus, like Belarusian protests are very much in the mood we try to do exactly what we're saying we're trying to do. We want fair elections. We want uh, for police brutality to stop. We want uh, we want people to uh, be who are responsible for the orders and for the actions to be uh, convicted in the court of law, not you know by crowd like just crowd uh, you know lynching them or whatever. And um, there has been no which is also important for many leftists and Russians, there has been no calls for removal of statues of Lenin that we have all over the place, or for renaming things, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is not about that, you know, the, and this is not the sort of discussion that uh, we are having, and uh, we have been very consistent in terms of messaging, you know, right? Uh, in terms of what people demand. And uh, uh, it has been very positive and very interesting. I didn't expect Belarus to do this, you know, to walk out in the streets in a peaceful manner like that on a, such a huge extent. Like I'm watching the news and I'm learning the names of uh, like our villages and cities. I've never learned. I never knew we had villages and cities under those names. And I learned about that only because people walked outside, you know, for pro to protest there, which is amazing, you know. So, so you talked about the economy and do you, do you think mm -hmm. that these protests happening right now are they a result of like economic dissatisfaction or because um, yeah. even even in the 2018 report i saw like by the united mm -hmm. nation um it called belarus yeah. to be like doing fairly well it called it a 
highly developed developing nation i believe um mm-hmm. so economic um situation at least by like bodies like the un isn't very dire in belarus right um would, would you agree with that it's not dire when it comes to urban population definitely okay uh we don't have people dying in the streets of hunger that's for sure mm-hmm. but the economic situation is not good at all okay. uh if you want to like uh, it's not because we have been economically stagnant for many many years for 20 years or so um the development like the economic development is very stagnant very slow and uh we had major crises that have been completely ignored by the government for example the covid situation right government has ignored the issue for the most part completely uh, they lied about the numbers they hid the truth about what is happening they didn't allow like any medics to do anything you know in terms of public outreach and um it wasn't good it wasn't good we still have it going on and uh, the protests will definitely spread covid even more yeah uh, uh and uh, i must say that the government has completely abandoned its people and its medics and for the most part our med our healthcare service national healthcare service when it comes to covid was running on people's donations and on non government organizations starting and um, using you know volunteers help and m- money to support the medics by buying them you know building equipment you know like building masks and uh, whatever because there is no nothing left and they were just buying everything to bring it to the doctors and medics because government has abandoned them completely and the covid situation is like very to a very big extent something that has completely severed the trust of the people in the government even more than it has before uh then like we had a big like when it comes to minsk specifically we had a huge like breakage of the public uh public waterworks where we had like dirty water coming out smelly water even coming out that smelled like amniac or whatever uh, out of the uh out of the water system and uh out of the tap and the government is again hidden the fact about that you know the they have there have been instances of people being poisoned by this hospitalized and uh government ve- made a very limited effort to bring fresh water to people affected by this and uh they did barely anything you know to help people and this happens every time our country faces a crisis government doesn't really do it they try to preserve the positions for example of state employees and employees of state run uh industries straight run factories they try to keep them employed but this very often results in slashing their salaries for like to a fourth just to keep them employed and paying them almost nothing and like like they did in in the factory of mars where they produce like uh automobiles and machines uh they have um buses etc cetera, etc cetera. they have stopped half of the factory and have kept the workers on a meager pay just to give them anything and uh, despite the fact that the uh, the factory has been mismanaged for years the factory there is prevalent corruption everywhere uh and um they are basically doing in it, when it comes to crisis they're just doing very limited damage control when it comes to everything without solving any issues or addressing them openly and directly because that would raise you know a concern that the government is not in control you right. know that was raise suspicion that the government is not dealing with it you know and they're failing at something and it's not something you want to do when you run a dictatorship you know you don't want people to think you are bad at something <laughs> but more and more it is obvious that they are bad at many things and um, economy wasn't good the pensions are very low the the belly survivable many of our pensioners or older generation has to decide whether they want to buy bread or a medicine for this month because they can't afford both uh and uh, the only way to succeed ultimately in this country is to become a programmer actually yeah. like it's very similar to like to india to some parts <laughs> of india yeah. like everyone is pushing people into it because yeah. it is when you when western money is where you have outsourced you know so in the india startups. lost its um, like chance at manufacturing so we just skipped over back yeah. like just got to it because that's where you get the money yeah 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 
and we have that to a big extent. And um, a lot of IT de- IT is now questioning its its it, it being in Belarus by saying, if this is the climate you are doing, like business won't come, investment won't come, and so they are a lot of people are threatening to leave the country for Ukraine, for example, because Ukraine has very similar situation when it comes to uh, staff, when it comes to uh, education, IT education, and so m- maybe we should go to Ukraine, you know. And uh, that would mean a loss of a lot of money for us. And um, that's not something, you know, that people want to do, like in the government. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's the way to earn money in Belarus, you know? Yeah. So basically, uh, it's not good. So it's the worsening economic um, problems. It's the yeah. pandemic. And um, would you also say that the, the um, option for another election by Tikhanovskaya is what led to this moment being what it is, right? Like this did not happen like during the last elections, but it's happening mm-hmm. right now. So yeah. is, is, is the it's a combination elect- of many, many things just breaking apart. Yes, right. it's the COVID, it's everything. It's social media being as prevalent as it is right now. Mm-hmm. And it is just people being sick and tired of everything and right. wanting change. And this idea spreading outside of just, you know, university students and into the masses and them actually wanting that too. If it wasn't for the workers, uh, if it wasn't for older generation, uh, we won't be here talking about this. It wouldn't be a, such a big of a deal. We wouldn't be at the point when we have a potential regime change happening any day now. Mm. And um, yeah, it, it's all led up to this. And it is not a question of, oh, should we support the protesters? You know, It is the question of how do we make sure that this regime change is peaceful and beneficial to the people of Belarus, because it's not state, it's not Western funded regime change that we are used to. Yeah. I believe personally that it is a genuine grassroots movement that has has to go somewhere now with this all, you know, and there are a lot of a lot of people that want to co-opt it. And I really hope that it won't get co-opted to an extent where the people of Belarus will be at the, you know, uh, the bargaining chip in the geopolitical uh, in the geopolitical world, or will just get you know nothing out of all of it. So, are people uh, rallying around uh, Takinovskaya and getting her to be the, like the transitory president? I guess. Yeah, people people do because everyone voted for her. She's right. now in Lithuania because she was threatened for her life and mm-hmm. the life of her children by the state. At least that's what we assume happened because there is almost no communication with her and it is just what we get from uh, people close to her and yeah people do support her and people want her to be president and because everyone voted for her and people want a new election with her as the interim president basically and um what do you think lukashenko's um response is going to be is uh, he seems to be communicating no with putin um yeah yeah so i think he's panicking i don't think he knows what his plan is okay. that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> he has no idea he's running around like doing his own rally which he has never done hmm. since the 90s he has never talked in front of the crowd since then uh he's running to the you know to the factory workers and yeah. he has been talking to putin trying you know for him to do something about this i don't think he, putin will do anything because uh russia doesn't support failing states <laughs> they haven't support the government in kyrgyzstan or in uh, uh, armenia when they had their own uh, regime changes which were very peaceful and popular so i don't think he will support president out of nowhere he might give him like you know um he might like th- give you like uh send him to russia give him like a residence like there, allow him know, to stay when... after the regime change yeah 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 like he did with yanukovych but i don't think anything would change at right. all like i don't think he, they would give the troops or nothing like that mm-hmm. at least well, as long as people as long as it's popularly supported you know right so yeah. what can people do watching what what, what, what can people like the watch uh, watching this video and in general just do to just mm-hmm. i guess support this happening yeah uh, uh, educate yourself about belarus mm-hmm. get informed about what is actually happening 
I will throw you a link for the fund that collects money for people who suffered under police brutality. Yeah. So they can donate monetarily yeah, if we'll they quite we'll have can that and the spread the word about them. That. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And uh, it's official. Like I know the organizations that run this. It's 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 legit. They have already gained, I believe, two million dollars of support. Just you know, to cover medical costs, to cover um, uh, costs like fines that the government is issuing for protesters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, it's very much appreciated if you share that. And uh, please keep your eye on Belarus when the regime finally changes, because we will need to educate ourselves on how to do politics and what are politics because we haven't done that since lukashenko got elected okay and uh, keep your keep your eye don't forget about us when this whole thing goes goes down basically that's that's my you know general uh me asking people to do this you know absolutely yeah mm -hmm. okay queensberry thank you so much for coming on the show thank you very much i hope it was, you stay it was a safe. pleasure to talk about that thank yeah, you yeah and good luck i will for try what happens yeah Thank you. Have a nice one. You too.